there's the Dane. Right. Um, so we talked about Protista. There's lots more we could say about them, but that's all we got time for. Uh, the next kingdom I want to talk about is the fungi. And I've actually got some show and tell here again. Unfortunately, I don't keep as good track of the leftovers in my refrigerator as I probably should. Maybe you have had similar things. And I found out this morning that what used to be some leftover beef stew that was actually pretty tasty, if I say so myself, looks like this. And I don't know, it's hard to get the lighting on this just right, but there is fuzzy white stuff that looks like cotton balls uh, growing on it. Uh, there we go, kind of in the center right there. That That's fuzzy white stuff on top of my poor beef stew. Uh, you probably had similar things happen to food in uh, your uh, refrigerator. And there we go, there in the center, there's a couple of those big fuzzy cotton ball things. And that shows us that we're dealing with the fungi. And what I'm going to do is I actually picked up some of that fuzzy stuff on another little glass slide. And if I can get this to work, I'm going to put a little thing we call a cover slip uh, on top. And I'm going to put this under the microscope. And we're going to see what that cotton fuzz looks like. And I'm going to plug in the microscope camera. And give it a minute. Okay, sorry, I'm having slight troubles with my monitor. Give me a moment. Okay. Um, right, microscope should be connected. We'll turn it on. And there. So what are we looking at here? Okay, that's kind of weird. Okay, this is all kind of a big mess, but let me move out to the edge of it a little bit. There, if I crank up the contrast a tiny amount, there we go. Okay. All right, that's a fungus. You're seeing a whole lot of little round things. The tiny round things are called spores. And each spore you can think of as being analogous to a seed. The rest of the fungus body is made up of a bunch of filaments. You see them kind of starting towards the middle, extending over towards the right. Uh, there is a whopping number There we go, you can see more. You can see lots and lots and lots and lots of little tangled filaments. Uh, these things look like cotton balls growing on my former beef stew. And each little strand in that cotton ball, each one of the little fuzz strands that you see is one of these filaments. And the filament that makes up the body of a typical fungus is called a hypha. H-Y-P-H-A, and a mass of hyphae uh, typically connected to each other, forming this uh, branching network, uh, growing all through whatever the fungus is feeding on, like my former beef stew. That mass of hyphae has a name. It's called a mycelium, M-Y-C-E-L-I-U-M, -E mycelium. So it's a good thing this is not growing on the ceiling in my shower, uh, or I'd look up and say, there's a mycelium in my ceiling. Get it? 
Uh, right. Okay. Sorry about that. So each of these, each one of these filaments is a hypha, and uh, the mass of all of the filaments taken together is a mycelium. And oh, this is. Hang on a sec. This is interesting. Or I think it's interesting. And I'm the professor, so nye. All right, I'm going to try to zoom in on something that has just caught my eye. There we go. Okay, you get a closer up view of the spores of the tiny round or oval things. Uh, all of the long stringy things are hyphae. And I think I spotted. Uh, this is going to be cool if it works out. If I can only find this thing. Okay. Yeah, right there. Um, it's going to be kind of hard for me to point out. I'm going to try to get it in the center. Okay, by the way, the spores can't move on their own. Uh, the only thing that's moving them is that uh, water is flowing uh, over the surface of this slide. Uh, that's the source of the, uh, of the movement that you're seeing. It's not uh, uh, fungi can't swim or anything like that. And where was it? Give me, give me just a second because this has the potential to be, well, you may not be impressed, but this has the potential to be something that would be very impressive to me if I could show you. Okay, down at the lower left, okay, there's kind of a huge mass of spores in the center. And if you look at the lower, oh, they're actually doing it twice. Um, you've got, over on the left-hand side, there's a filament that is coming down from the top and one coming up from the bottom. And where they join, there's a sort of round thing in between them. And there's another one just to the right of that. There's a filament coming in from the left-hand side of the field of view, um, from the left-hand side about midway down and kind of slanting down diagonally. And I wish I had some kind of pointer on this thing. Um, and then there's kind of a swelling and another filament coming in from the upper right. Uh, what we've actually caught is fungi having sex in my beef stew. Um, when two fungi decide that they like each other, uh, two hyphae grow together, uh, form a round lump in between called a zygospore. And um, in that zygospore, they mingle their genetic material, and that zygospore will eventually produce new hyphae and new, new spores. Um, and the spores will grow into new offspring that contain genetic material from each parent. Uh, there's actually, good grief. Yeah, I can, I can actually see lots more in here. Places where you have two hyphae that have met and are forming a swelling uh, in, the, uh, in between the two. There's a nice one over on the left-hand side there. Uh, basically, it look, I'm seeing a couple of others that are kind of hidden by the spores. Uh, but basically, it looks like these fungi are just having a swingers party uh, right in the middle of my beef stew. So, um, yeah, sorry to have to expose you to that, but um, I caught these fungi in the act of having a whole lot of sex. Um, so there. Sorry about that. Um, right. I'm going to switch over to... Um, switch over to the slides. And this is what you've already seen, uh, that most fungi, if you take them under the microscope, look like a network of filaments. Each filament is called a hypha, uh, plural hyphae. And the network collectively made up of all of these hyphae is called a mycelium. 
each hypha is made up of many cells and the whole thing is surrounded by a cell wall. You might recall that bacteria, many of them, are surrounded by a cell wall that's made at least in part of this stuff called peptidoglycan. Fungi, the cells are surrounded by a cell wall made of a different substance, a carbohydrate type uh, called chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N, but we say chitin, not chitin for some reason. Oh, wow, I just got this mental image of two fungi that are fusing to form a zygospore and one of them stares at the other and says, wait a minute, honey, before we do this, have you been chitting on me? You know, your chitin heart will tell on you. That's why we call it chitin, uh, to avoid puns like that, chitin. And there's a big mass of hyphae. Every one of those tiny little hair-like strands in that picture is a hypha. And the collective mass is called a mycelium. So the cotton balls on my food um, are mycelia. You've probably seen similar things. Uh, the fuzzy gr greenish gray stuff that tends to build up on oranges that have been left outside for too long. That would also be a mycelium. Now, in many fungi, not all of them, but many, uh, here you've got, this is kind of a slice through some soil. And all of those white filaments right there, that's hyphae. In many fungi, well, in many fungi, the hyphae grow into this network. And it may not even be visible. Because one place where lots and lots of uh, fungi love to live is soil. Um, and they'll form this network of microscopic filaments that grows all through the soil. Uh, they're actually able to digest uh, dead bodies of anything, dead bugs or, you know, dead squirrels and especially dead leaves. Uh, they're able to break those down and feed on them and extract energy and molecules from them. So the great majority of a fungus is this underground network of hyphae, this underground mycelium that you might never see, except for the times that periodically the hyphae in a mycelium will kind of start webbing up together, uh, kind of tangling together in something that looks a little bit like dreadlocks. And these bundles of hyphae will thicken, they'll swell, and they'll put up these structures that often stick up above the ground known as sporocarps. Uh, and sporocarps include mushrooms, among others. Uh, so that's actually a home mushroom farm. Uh, you can actually buy um, soil that's been inoculated uh, with the right type of hyphae um, that will grow in this you know, bucket on your windowsill and uh, eventually start sprouting mushrooms. And what a mushroom is made of is basically a whole bunch of braided and matted hyphae uh, growing up from this huge mycelium, almost all of which is underground. Um, this is called a fairy ring, by the way, uh, because uh, fairies have been dancing uh, in a ring at night, uh, leaving behind these mushrooms where they tread, um, because fairies wear boots and you've got to believe it, or at least that's what Ozzy once said. Anyway, um, these probably have not actually been caused by fairies, but they do have this very distinctive ring shape. And the reason is that underneath that ring in the soil, there's a big mycelium, uh, probably spreading out beyond the visible fairy ring. You know, it might cover a very large patch of soil, but because the hyphae are A, microscopic, and B, underground, uh, you can't see them. Uh, you'd have to do some very careful microscope work to detect the hyphae. But periodically, especially on a day like today, after a nice heavy rain, which we had in Conway yesterday, um, the mycelium will send up some specialized hyphae that mat together and produce these sporocarps. So the ring of mushrooms that you see is the only visible sign 
that there's a great big mycelium under that soil. I've actually spotted fairy rings in um, some of the older neighborhoods of Conway uh, will get these sprouting up on their lawns when, um, again, it's usually after a, um, uh, usually after a nice rain is when the mushrooms come up. So yeah, that's all you can see of the single mycelium. And myceliums can get huge. The largest living thing in the world is a fungal mycelium. And nobody has ever seen the whole thing. We can take little samples of it from different parts of its extent, but you've never seen the whole thing. It's these microscopic network of underground fungus. Um, and the largest known thing covers more than six UCA campuses, a total of 2,200 acres, or if you'd rather go metric, almost 900 hectares or three and a half square miles. Um, that's in Oregon. This is an aerial photo of some national forest in Montana. Uh, so you're looking at a whole lot of trees from an airplane and kind of down in the lower right, sorry, lower left. And again, in the upper right, there's these kind of circular patches that are a little grayish where the trees don't seem to be doing quite as well. Those little light patches that you're seeing down at the lower right and at the upper, sorry, the lower left and the upper right, there we go, um, are areas where the trees are being infected by a single fungus mycelium that's penetrating into the tree roots and damaging the trees. And each one of those patches is about 20 acres. And each one of those patches is caused by one ginormous mycelium growing under the soil from tree root to tree root to tree root, uh, causing damage to the trees. Uh, fungi can cause very severe um, damage to forests and damage to crops. Some of them can, not all do, but these certainly can. There are some fungi that don't form hyphae uh, that live as single-celled um, single celled organisms for at least part and sometimes all of their life cycle. Uh, what you're looking at here is a picture taken through a microscope of single-celled fungi. Um, in the center, you can see two of them. They're in the process of uh, dividing, uh, reproducing. And a single-celled fungus that doesn't form hyphae is called a yeast, um, including uh, bread yeast and brewer's yeast. Uh, bread yeast is, of course, what you add to dough to make it rise and you know bake some nice light and fluffy bread. Uh, brewer's yeast you add to solutions of um, malted grain uh, to make beer or to fruit juice to make wine. So I'm assuming you've heard of yeast at some point. If you haven't, it's the yeast you could do. Uh, right. So a yeast is a fungus that doesn't make hyphae. There are some yeasts that actually can switch hit. This is, I think that's a sample of human vaginal mucus. If I haven't mentioned this, I used to be a volunteer lab tech at a place called the Berkeley Free Clinic. And I used to test vaginal samples all the time. They were fascinating to look at. And it's not something that bothers me to talk about. I'm, hopefully, I'm not making people uncomfortable. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you don't want to talk about in public sometimes. It can be awkward to talk shop. Um, but the uh, fungus here has been stained dark purple. Uh, the pinkish stuff is just cells and mucus that have been stained. And you can see you've got both kind of football-shaped uh, dark purple things and long filaments. And this is because this particular yeast in its life cycle will switch between a single-celled stage and a hyphal stage. Uh, so part of its life will be as a bunch of hyphae, and then for part of its life, it will divide up into single cells. This is the fungus that causes vaginal yeast infections it can also cause infections of the lining of the inside of your mouth. Uh, 
newborn babies tend to get this. It's a very common childhood infection. It's not usually very serious. If anybody's ever heard of something called thrush, uh, that is a yeast infection of the lining of uh, your mouth. Uh, usually it looks like little white patches forming on the inside of the mouth. And again, it's usually not something to be too terribly concerned about. A lot of babies get it. Uh, but that's another condition that's caused by fungus infecting human bodies. So there, the more you know. This is what I was ooing and eyeing over a minute ago. Uh, this is maybe a little clearer than I was able to get it on my slide. Uh, not all fungi have sex, but many of them do. And what will happen is that two hyphae will join together like this, kind of press up end to end. And the two hyphae have to be of different mating types. We don't call them male and female because there's no way to tell the difference uh, from the outside. Um, they'll have different tiny molecules on the surface, uh, but they don't look different outwardly. So instead of calling them male and female, we usually call them plus and minus, uh, sometimes type A and type alpha, um, sometimes other things not really important here. But two hyphae of different mating types will press together and they'll make a swelling in between that will sprout a new hypha. So those are the two hyphae that are pushing together and right where they're joining, a new hypha is going to sprout out. And that hypha will lengthen and develop a swelling on the end and that swelling will divide up. And that new hypha, which contains genetic material from both of the parent hyphae, will bud off a whole bunch of single celled spores, which you were seeing just a minute ago. Um, those spores will fall off and, you know, in the wild, maybe they'll drift away on the wind or be carried by water or something like that. Um, in the case of my poor beef stew, uh, they probably were just in the air and drifted onto it uh, the last time I opened it. And because I haven't disturbed it for a while, the spores have had time to grow. If I'd eaten it sooner, uh, they wouldn't have had time to produce those big mycelia. Anyway, more than you wanted to know, I'm sure. But the spores will fall off and they'll sprout, if you like, into new hyphae. And round goes the circle of life. Each new hypha containing genetic material from both parents um, will grow and lengthen and divide and branch and produce a new mycelium. And eventually that new mycelium will fuse with other mycelia and send up uh, sexual hyphae, which make more spores. And it's the circle of life. Right. Sorry about that. Okay. In many species, that sexual hypha will divide, it'll branch, it will web together in that way that, um, that they do that you saw in a previous slide, forming that kind of dreadlock-like uh, strands, uh, which swell up and they'll put out um, a big above ground lump where the spores get produced. Instead of just having, as here, instead of having just one hypha produce the spores, they'll have this big mass of matted hyphae that produces the spores. And when you have that, we call it a sporocarp. You'll also see them called fruiting body, although technically these are not fruits. Uh, they're not even plants, they're fungi. And you know sporocarps very well uh, because they include mushrooms. Uh, these are armillaria mushrooms. Uh, if you remember that giant fungus in Oregon uh, that takes up three and a half square miles, that's the mushrooms that it puts out. Um, if you could parachute into the middle of that national forest, uh, you could pick mushrooms like that. Uh, some of them are actually edible. And you'd never be aware that you were sitting on top of a, you know, three and a half square mile network of hyphae under your feet, except you might notice that the trees were all looking sick. 
There are lots of other types of sporocarps, uh, so-called bracket fungi. Uh, this is actually a tree in Laurel Park a couple of years ago. Uh, the tree is sick, and it's sick because there are um, hyphae growing through the wood and breaking it down and digesting it. And eventually they'll cause the tree to fall once they've broken down enough of the wood. Wood rot is mostly fungi doing. So that whole tree is full of hyphae breaking down the wood. And then periodically the hyphae put out little fruiting bodies, the common name for which is shelf fungi or bracket fungi. And any walk in the woods around here, if you find dead wood, uh, some shelf fungi um, break down only dead wood and they don't hurt live trees, but some do harm uh, live trees. Uh, but just about any log that's been sitting around in the woods for long enough is going to have uh, bracket fungi in, um, in some numbers. Uh, there's a really big colorful one on a tree that's uh, just outside the student center, or at least there used to be. I don't know if it's still there. Um, other sporocarps you might have heard of include, um, I forgot to include the picture, but there's coral fungi, truffles you might have heard of, that's sporocarps that grow underground, uh, puffballs, uh, jelly fungi, um, and morels which are the most delicious mushroom you've ever heard of. So the part of the fungus that you see, the little mushroom growing above ground or the bracket fungus uh, growing out of dead or diseased wood or the um, rather obscene looking mutinous fungi growing out of your cedar mulch, uh, whatever they are, they're only if you don't mind me mixing my metaphors, they're the tip of the iceberg. Um, they are, you know, just a little sample of what's growing below your feet in that soil or in that wood, penetrating it and filling it everywhere with these growing hyphae forming this mycelial network. Incidentally, uh, those fruiting bodies, the sporocarps, are sexual reproductive structures. There are some fungi that nobody has ever caught having sex. And we lump these together in a group called the fungi imperfecti, the imperfect fungi. Um, great example would be at the fungus that causes athlete's foot, uh, shown here. Uh, closely related is the fungus that causes ringworm, uh, which is technically not actually a worm. Um, the fungus that causes jock itch, um, green bread mold, not black bread mold, and not this white stuff on my beef stew, but uh, if you've ever seen fuzzy green stuff growing on a piece of bread that's been left out for too long, uh, that is a fungus, and it's probably an imperfect fungus, one that doesn't engage in sexual reproduction. So, yeah. That's why you don't have, um, yeah, that, that's why you don't get mushrooms growing out of a piece of moldy bread because the fungi that rot your bread don't have sex. Now you know, I'm sure you're thrilled. Okay, common fungal diseases like athlete's foot, annoying, but usually not really dangerous. I've never heard of anyone die of athlete's foot uh, the only person who ever died of jock itch was Captain Hook. But fungi that get deeper into the body can be very dangerous. That's a sample from the lungs of someone infected with a yeast. Uh, those kind of black staining round things that you see in the middle there, those are yeast cells uh, belonging to a species called Pneumocystis urovecii. And Pneumocystis urovecii causes very severe and often lethal pneumonia. Most people can actually fight this off, but people whose immune systems are damaged uh, can get very sick because they don't have the ability to resist the infection and, and kill it. They can't kill these yeast. Um, and Pneumocystis urovecii is especially known 
for causing lethal pneumonia in people with full-blown AIDS. Now, this is not as common as it used to be because we have drugs now that make infection with HIV manageable. It's not great, but you can live a pretty decent lifespan uh, by taking uh, HIV medication. I'm old enough to remember when it was a death sentence and you don't actually die of HIV. What happens is that it targets your immune system, leaving you um, vulnerable to attack from a wide range of other diseases. And one of them is pneumonia, lung infection caused by pneumocystis urovecii. Uh, so this killed a lot of AIDS patients uh, back in the 80s uh, before better treatments were available. On a lighter note, um, yeast also break down sugar, and when they do that, their byproducts are alcohol and carbon dioxide. Uh, so if you add yeast to a sweet solution of malted grain, uh, the yeast eat the sugar in the malted grain, and they produce ethyl alcohol, and they produce bubbles of carbon dioxide, and you get beer. If you add yeast to bread dough, uh, the yeast will break down the sugar. They'll create alcohol and carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide makes the bubbles in your, uh, in your bread, uh, which makes it rise and be light and fluffy and all that. Um, there's also alcohol in there, but the baking process usually drives that away, makes it evaporate. Uh, so you could, in theory, get drunk by eating huge amounts of raw bread dough, uh, but I'm not going to recommend it. You probably only just make yourself really sick before anything else happened. Uh, so not recommended there. Um, incidentally, some of you might know that if you make bread and you don't add yeast, um, an old word for bread yeast was leaven, and if you don't add yeast to your bread, you get unleavened bread, uh, which is eaten ritually in things like uh, Passover celebrations in Judaism, um, and is very, uh, very, very hard and flat like a cracker. Uh, so without those yeast, your bread doesn't rise, and it's very dense and very, very hard and you've got crackers or, you know, matzahs, things like that. Now you know. Uh, there's also, of course, edible mushrooms, edible truffles, um, foods that require fungi to produce include things like soy sauce. Soy sauce is produced by um, a fungus um, growing on uh, crushed soybeans. Uh, miso, that's uh, commonly used in like Japanese style soup, is a product that's produced by fungus fermentation. Uh, fungi are used in Japanese cuisine to produce sake, uh, an alcoholic drink sometimes called rice wine. Fungi are deliberately added to things like blue cheese. Uh, those blue streaks are fungus mycelium growing through the cheese. Uh, which gives it its texture and its uh, its flavor. And there's even fungi that are commercially grown to produce protein-rich meat substitutes. Uh, the common name for this is corn. And I took that picture at one of our local Kroger's. So you can get um, meat substitute made out of a species of fungus that's quite rich in protein. Um, if you are if you are so minded, look for corn. Last but not least, fungi produce antibiotics. Uh, penicillin is probably the best known. Uh, penicillin was discovered in the 1920s by a guy named Alexander Fleming, who was growing bacteria in a dish with a nutrient called nutrient agar, and wasn't very careful and some fungi got in the dish and he happened to notice that wherever the fungi were growing, the bacteria weren't. So the fungus was producing some kind of substance that was stopping bacterial growth. Well, he isolated that stuff, uh, called it penicillin because it came from a fungus called penicillium 
and penicillin was the first um, uh, was the first antibiotic to come into use. Um, it saved lives in World War II, and of course, it saved countless millions of lives since then. And derivatives of penicillin have been developed, and um, yeah, so they called it a wonder drug uh, when it came out, and that was produced by fungi. Uh, tell you what, I've got another bit of show and tell. So, so I'm going to cut back over to uh, me, and I want to show you what I did this morning. There. I went up um, early, early in the morning at about, uh, oh, about seven, I suppose, and went out to a place that I know that I'm not going to tell you exactly where, and collected a whole bunch of sporocarps. Uh, this is a type that is very abundant in oak and hickory forest right at about this time of year. Um, it's called uh, chanterelle fungus, and you can see it's got kind of a dent up in the top, so it looks a little like a trumpet. And it's got this very distinctive orange color, which can be anywhere from a real strong orange to a kind of light peach. And if you tear open the stem, you can see it's white on the inside, or very light brown. And I was able to pick about a pound of these suckers without even trying hard. There's my harvest of chanterelles. Uh, they are, they can be pretty abundant in summer if you get the right spot. And they tend to grow in patches. You'll walk through the woods and not see anything. And then all of a sudden, boom, you'll be standing in the middle of, you know, hundreds of them. So there's my chanterelle harvest. I think that's the largest one that I got right there. And I can't tell you exactly where I got these because I'd have to kill you, but there are lots of places you can find them. They're delicious. I had some for dinner last night. Most mushrooms you really have to be careful about because the delicious ones can look almost identical to some deadly ones. Um, many wild mushrooms will make you sick uh, sometimes it's nothing worse than a seriously upset stomach. Uh, other times you eat them and you've got seven days to get a liver transplant or you're dead. Um, yeah, so this can be this can be pretty rough. But golden chanterelles are actually very hard to mess up. Um, I won't say it's completely foolproof, but there's not much else that grows in the forest at this time of year that looks like them. And each chanterelle is a spore carp. Uh, so here's one again. And on the underside of this cap right here, I don't know how well you can see this because the lighting in this room is not great at the moment. Uh, but on the underside of this cap, there's little wrinkles. On those wrinkles, there's specialized structures. The, the technical name is basidia uh, that produce spores. And when the spores are ripe, they'll fall off. They'll go drifting away on the breeze and hopefully land somewhere where they can sprout into new hyphae. Uh, they can grow into the soil and gain energy from breaking down dead leaves, especially dead oak leaves. They tend to like oak for whatever reason. And, uh, and so it goes. So that is a gourmet treat that you probably shouldn't go out and collect just on the basis of me telling you about it. Um, even mushrooms that are almost everyone finds edible can sometimes cause sensitivity reactions in people. And you should probably get a little bit more expertise on exactly what to look for. Uh, but there are plenty of edible mushrooms around here um, that, uh, uh, that some people, including me, uh, forage for given the chance. So I just wanted to show you that I got about a pound of uh, very, very nice um, uh, fungal sporocarps, particularly nice if you saute them in butter and uh, then add them to like a cream soup. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to brag about that. 
and I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and we'll pick up plants uh, in the next one.